We do. It's actually working smoothly. That's what we like to see. I'm gonna just uh, while we're while we're getting started here, I'm gonna just get my emergency going. A little vitamin C on these days when you can't really. Uh, I mean, I know vitamin D is the sun, but I feel like on these days when it's like, I know I'm going to be trapped inside most of the day because of the snow. I'm going to get some vitamin D going. And a little ASMR here while we pour this in. Hey, I hope you guys enjoy that. That beautiful sound. You got most of it. It's a beautiful Wednesday morning. Tambora Station, what is up? Morning, rise and shine. Yeah, that's right. That's how we roll. Oops. Let me just over here so we got good music. We got good, good drinks. We got good energy. We're gonna have a good day today. I know it. All right, let's get into it here. We got a lot of work to do today, and uh, I'm gonna probably only go for an hour today because it's gonna snow a bunch, and I didn't prep the firewood as much as I probably should have so we're gonna have to <laughs> we're gonna have to go and do some firewood today but that's okay we got a very specific goal that we're trying to get through and I think we're gonna at least be able to make some progress on this thing so let me just talk to you guys a little bit about what I did uh yesterday before I get started what's up Robert welcome welcome uh, I saw Robert ordered a shirt so thank you very much Robert you get the softest shirt in the game now let me just show you guys this is what happens if you buy shirts from a different vendor the new shirts are from uh, a new vendor, and this is from the old vendor. And basically, everybody I know uh, who has a Too Tall Toby shirt has started to experience stuff like this. This is no good. You don't want this from your shirt. You came. It had words on it originally, uh, so you know you don't want that. So if you have a shirt like this, one of the older shirts, there's a chance to get a new one. Softest shirts in the game. TooTallToby.com/slash/merch. And uh, you know these shirts are okay. Softness. They're not nearly as soft as the new ones. Uh, and of course you end up losing the logo, which does look kind of cool, kind of retro, kind of like, you know, intentionally faded. Unfortunately, it's not intentional and unfortunately it's not stopping. So every time I watch it, I lose a little more of myself. So I guess the lesson there is don't wash your clothes. Let's get into it. Uh, yesterday I did a little bit of work on this thing. The, the, a big thing that I did yesterday was I re-examined the paint. You guys know that the paint has really been bothering me. So um, to address this issue with the paint, I did two things. First of all, I edited the uh, master model layout part and included a sketch in the master model layout part to define the depth of the body. So there's a new sketch here in the master model layout part. It is this sketch here. Let me go into edit sketch. So you can see that what this is, is it's just a line coming down, a line going over, a line going up, and then a midpoint line here uh, that's sticking out to an arbitrary dimension depth. Uh, one thing that's kind of cool to remember in SolidWorks is you can always write mouse button on a dimension. And then down at the very bottom here, you can say mark for drawing. The dimension will change to this purple color, which means that when you go to create a drawing and you use the command insert model items, that dimension is not tagged to go into the drawing. Now, the significance of that is that uh, that dimension uh, will also just insta show up in purple, which is just kind of like a visual cue to you that this is a do nothing dimension. Uh, it's just, it's really just there to make sure that this thing stays on this side because uh, I'm going to use it for a plane later. So that's that sketch. It's the body depth 1.770 uh, coming down as a sketch rather than just doing it as a plane. And then I do have a plane for body thickness. So I edited the definition of that plane and created a coincident relationship. So that plane is now parallel to the top plane. So there's top plane parallel coincident to a point. And what is that point? That point is this point right here. So it's parallel to the top plane at that point. So it's still in the same location, but a little bit more consistency in how it's defined. And similarly, the mid plane, instead of the mid plane being between two surfaces, the mid plane is now, um, where is it? Body mid plane. This is also defined by this sketch here. So like the mid plane is being used to define the location of this. And I don't know if it's being used for this hole. I don't think it is. I think it's mainly just being used for this uh, this region here, the instrument jack. Uh, so the uh, redefinition of the body in that sense, that was the main thing that I did with the master layout. 
And, you know, the reason I did that is is just, again, for consistency. I want to make sure that uh, uh, everything is kind of being driven from the master model layout sketch. And when you start kind of mixing and matching planes and the sketch, it gets things get a little bit dicey. Uh, another thing that I did yesterday after we went offline was I made a uh, modification to the paint itself. So what we did originally was we took the... Um, we took this external surface here via right mouse button select tangency and we offset that like 10 thou and then we thickened it in uh, 8 thou to represent the paint. And the problem is that the sketch that I just showed you a moment ago, you know, if, if we still had that set up, then the sketch that I showed you a moment ago, the master model layout sketch, would essentially be doing something like this. So meaning that it would not quite be sticking at the uh, uh, planar, you know, coplanar to that top surface. It would be slightly inside of that top surface and that bottom surface. Now, why is that a problem in this case? Well, it's a problem because the bridge sits up here. So instead of the bridge sitting right on top of the, um, I gotta remember what the shortcut is for rectangle. Is it, uh, what is it, what is it? Control, control is the shortcut. So if the bridge is sitting up here, we want the bridge to be sitting directly on top of the body, but instead the bridge was sitting more like this, like down in the body. Um, same thing with the instrument panel, we, you know, the instrument uh, instrument jack plate. We want the instrument jack plate to be sitting on top of the paint, but instead it was kind of just buried in, just a little bit, you know, like five thou buried in. So I didn't like that. I, I, I want this to, you know, I want all this geometry to sit exactly in the right spot. So I did a different approach and I used what's called move face. Now move face is like a secret weapon type of a move in SolidWorks. It's so powerful. Um, it can it can help you in so many different situations. This is a model that we did in Model Monday Live on, uh, on Monday night. And so let's say that uh, the customer comes back at us and he says, this looks really good, but I need to change the wall thickness of uh, this hole here, something like that. And, you know, maybe this is an imported bot, an imported model where you don't even have any driving features. You can't just double click and change the diameter of that hole. Well, you could use the command insert face move. And when you do insert face move, you could pick this face here and you could change the, um, the wall thickness, make the wall thickness a little thinner by increasing the diameter of that hole just by using insert face move. So before it looked like this, after it looks like this. Similarly, if the customer comes back and says, hey, I need this uh, the height of this boss to be a little bit lower, you know, certainly we could do a cut extrude, but what if this thing has draft on it? It's not gonna be nearly as easy. Well, we could just do insert face move and we could flip the direction of that thing and uh, you know change the height of that boss just using insert face move, even if it's an imported body or even if it has draft on it. So, you know, with the draft example, that's significant because let's say this thing does have draft on it. Let's go features draft. So even if it's a fully defined model with uh, features that you can, you know, you could edit. Well, now I've put draft on this thing. And so now if you imagine the location of this edge here is at a set. Sorry, uh, let me do this a different way. Sketch, convert. All right, so the location of these edges here are at a set location and a significant location. We don't want those locations to change. Well, if we did an edit feature and we changed the starting height of this boss down a few millimeters, the problem is that then the draft would also shift and now that edge would be, you know, shifted in a little bit. It would, you know, it would move in when the, that, that face moves down. But if instead we did it with a move face, it's more like a cut extrude where it just takes that whole face and shifts it down. So move face is just incredibly powerful, incredibly useful. And another thing that we could use move face for would be for shrinkage. If we knew that this entire model is supposed to shrink by five thou instead of a percentage, you know, I've worked with mold makers before and they, they can look at a part like this and they can say, you know, you could expect the whole thing to shrink by uh, X number of millimeters or X number of inches. They know the whole thing is going to shrink by a certain amount. Well, then you could go insert face move and you could say, um, I'm going to take the entire model. So every face on the model and I'm going to move it by 0, 0.0, uh, by 0 0.2 millimeters. So basically I just did a scale, but instead of scaling by percentage, I scaled by uh, an explicit linear value. 
So the model here, you can kind of see this corner moving. Every face on the model is moving out by 0.2 millimeters, and that way I can you know, design the mold around this geometry, and then I can expect it to contract when it cools, um, and that is a kind of a cool way of doing shrinkage instead of doing shrinkage by percentage, uh, which you would have to do if you did insert features scale. So um, long story short, or you know, not really, probably too late, right? Uh, that's a famous line from the movie Clue. If you guys have ever seen Clue, a little bit of an older movie. Uh, long story short, too late. What I did here was basically the same thing which, that I showed you a moment ago with shrinkage. So this face here is where the uh, face originally was. This is where the, the wooden face was originally. And we can see that if I roll back to before the move bodies for paint. So this, this face here just jumped out a little bit. And then if I roll forward, move bodies in for paint, I did a right mouse button select tangency and I selected all of those faces that are on the outside of the body and I moved them all in a set amount. It takes like 30 seconds for that feature to jump into edit mode, so I'm not gonna go into it right now. Um, but then after that, I'm sorry, before that, I took all those faces and I did an offset surface at zero. So I have all these faces here offset at zero. Then I did the uh, insert face move. So this is what it looks like with that surface on the outside, just a regular surface. And then I took that surface and I did a thicken. So now that surface has a, a small thickness to it. It's probably like three thou. And, uh, and now that means that if we look at the assembly, our geometry for things like the bridge are directly on the paint rather than being kind of uh, buried in the paint a little bit. So that's the uh, that's the, the the another thing that I changed with the model last night when I was working uh, off hours, and then the final thing that I did was I started the process of setting up this three-way switch so that it actually can be switched into the three different posi positions. I did not finish this process, but just so you can see what it looks like, um, I just did it with a move body. So did a little bit of adjustment on some of these faces here. Uh, changed, you know, the, the depth of some of those cuts. So created a cut, uh, created another cut that came in a little bit, took that face and moved it back down because it's a body, and then did a move body uh, by sketching an axis here that I can use for the move body command. So ideally, I'll have three configurations of this thing. Um, position one, position two, and then position three uh, will be in that. Actually, I could probably just do that right now, right? What's this cut extrude here? That should probably be before the move body stuff. So this move body one or move body copy here at the bottom of the tree. This could be position one or whatever two doesn't matter. Um, and then I can suppress that, and then I could do insert. Oh, let's see what that definition was actually. Uh, Thirty degrees. Okay. So insert features move slash copy. This is a move body command, and then I can say I want to take this body and this body, and I want to rotate them about. Oops, I get the sketch hidden. About this axis here, and I want to rotate them by 30 degrees. And then I will, oh, I got to do that by negative 30 degrees. Negative 30 degrees, there we go. And then I can hide that sketch. And now I can call this one position three. And you want to remember that the if you just have one feature like that that you just want to like quickly turn on and off in different configurations, the easiest way to do it, these are the wire stubs, the easiest way to do it is to uh, do a right mouse button configure feature. So if we do a right mouse button here and we say configure feature, so I'm just doing a right mouse button on that uh, move body uh, command. So we do a configure feature and then we double click here on position two as well. Then what we could do is we could create our three configurations. So this will be position one, enter, position two, enter, position three, enter. And so in position one, these are both gonna be suppressed um, and I'll leave them both suppressed in the default as well. And then position two, uh, position, uh, the position three feature will be suppressed and then in position, position three, the position two feature will be suppressed. And so if we say okay there and we go over to our configuration tree, we now have our position one, which is in the middle, position two and position three as our three different configurations of the switch. And so that makes it very easy for us to go into the assembly and then um, uh, go into the assembly and then change that, that component to use one of those different positions. So cool. All right, that's another 
Another little item off the checklist to get that done. Um, I also just went through and did a little bit of adjustment to some of these screws. I basically just changed them back to schematic screws um, instead of having them as helical through uh, helical screws, just because of the performance hit that you take when they are helical. So this sketch here is uh, defined with a width of the thread here, 032. I think I want to make the spacing just a little bit smaller. And then um, in the thread pattern, let me say this. There we go, that's better. So just a little bit of cleanup on some of the, the, the screws uh, that had thread. Again, you know, if you're looking at it at this view, or if you're looking at it in a wireframe, you can tell those are threaded, right? You can tell it's, it starts out as a solid shaft and then it becomes threaded. Uh, that's what matters. You want people to be able to look at this and be able to tell. So I'm kind of getting in the, the final phases of cleanup of this thing, getting ready for, uh, you know, uh, official release, if you will. Uh, so I want to, you know, I, I go through, I take my time, I go through, I look at each each feature, each, uh, co sorry, each component. Um, and as I'm going through and looking at each component, I'm looking at things like, uh, are all of my geometry named? Uh, is there anything shown that needs to be cleaned up, that needs to be hidden? So this would be like, main soap bar shape this would be uh top corner or top corner fillets uh that's the you know that's this obviously that's what that is uh and this is i think we were just using this to locate pole and then i would save that i would go down to the vault right mouse button check an active document the vault is down here, by the way. Uh, let me hide the chat. The vault's down here. Uh, you've got your... I don't want to show too much here because some of this is uh, proprietary, but this is what the vault looks like down here. It's uh, you got each of your parts listed. It shows you whether or not that part is owned uh, by you, the current user. It shows you the name of the file. It optionally shows you the file type, and it shows you the current revision in the vault. There's also other things that you can show here Like you could show if you're working on a team of people right in this box, you could see who currently owns the file. So if you need to make changes, let's say it was your turn to work on this pickup and uh, Bob has the pickup, you know, you'd be able to see that his, he's got it. And that way you could message him or call him. Um, in the old days, we used these things called telephones and we actually picked up the phone and called people. Nowadays, people use telephones and they type on them. Uh, I don't understand, but you know, maybe I'm just old school. So in the old days, we would pick up the phone and we would call Bob and we would say, hey, I need to work on that pickup. All right, enough talk about the old days. We're, that's not, we're not here to reminisce about the old days. We're here to create some uh, some strings. So let's do check an active document, check this thing in at the current revision, close out of that. Um, and basically what you would do at, at some point is you would do the same thing where you would go through each part one by one. Um, and after you feel like you have defined all of the features, everything is defined, everything looks good, all the metadata is in the file, like you would look at the file properties, you'd make sure all the metadata is in there. Um, this might be, you know, there might be things that you'd add in here, like vendor, that's a, that's a good one, uh, vendor, order number. And that way, um, you know, this could become from uh, foam unlimited. And then you could say, uh, uh, like, Let's say this is ordered in um, 36 inch strips. Uh, order number or part number 6053321. So you order this in 36 inch strips and you know, that's the order number you get it, something like that. Uh, so you go through, you fill out all the metadata and then you do your final check into the vault and you would say, all right, this part is ready to go. So the status is gonna change here from uh, my first status, which is prototype, where everything is dash .01, .02, .03, .04. You'd say, I'm gonna change that now. This is gonna be released, and I'm no longer gonna be the owner. And that's gonna take this file, if you look up top here, it's gonna take this file and make it read only. Now, the, the, you know, the, the individual mechanics of different CAD systems, whether you're using SolidWorks or Onshape or Fusion 360 or Inventor, you know, the, the individual mechanics of their data management system might be a little bit different. But but the overall concept, the overall idea is the same. And the idea is I can't make changes to this part unless I check the file out. 
So when I say I'm going to put this in at revision A and I'm checking the file back in, what's going to happen is I'm, I'm signaling the rest of my team that this part is ready to go. Drop this into a drawing. Everything you need is going to be in this part. You can make a drawing. You can get this thing ordered. You can put it into your um, you know, higher level, like uh, lifecycle management software, ordering software, whatever it is. So when I do check in, this file now changes to read only because the system is designed to not let you make a change to a file that has been released. If you want to make a change to that file, you have to actively grab the file. You have to tell, signal the rest of your team like, hey guys, there's a change to this file. I got the file, I'm working on it. And then it'll become rev A.01, A.02, A.03. And then when you release it again, when you make it read only again, it'll become rev B. So, you know, again, th this is a, uh, general generalities right think of it don't think of it as the specific mechanics but think of it as the generalities um and then that this will be the last thing that i'll say about this topic that file then uh will be tagged down in the uh down in the vault what's called the vault view that file will be tagged letting everybody know that no one is the owner so this has now been released to revision a and no one is the owner so it doesn't have the little uh in, in the case of SolidWorks, it's like a little check mark that tells you if, if you're the owner or if somebody else is the owner, but in a different CAD system, it might look a little different. But the, the general concept is the same. You work on the file, you have read-write access, you make it an iterative revision, and then it changes to a different lifecycle type and it becomes an official release. And then you release ownership of the file. You no longer can make changes. So I love PDM, guys. So, you know, I... Uh, I do really think, uh, I, I, I really uh, maximize the value from it. Look, I try to save this now, and it says, you can't save this. It's read only. Like, oh, crud. You know, similarly, if I tried to, like, make changes, it'll uh, it'll give me an error. Let's see if I, if I go to fill it, this, if it'll throw up an error. No, it didn't throw up an error there. Let's see if I go to, okay, here we go. So I went to make a dimensional change, and it says, hey, this file's read only. Uh, you probably shouldn't be changing it. And that's, like, a good signal to me, like, oh, this has already been released. Crap, I shouldn't shouldn't make any changes to this then if it's already been released because the customer might already have, you know, the file or the documentation and I don't want to be making changes to our records that are different from what the customer has. All right, I probably talked way too much about PDM considering that I told you guys that we were going to try to rush through today so I can so I can uh, uh, take care of, uh, you know, some, some firewood here at my place. So uh, let's go. Let's get into it. Our goal today, uh, I think that's the last the last of the changes that I made today, uh, or that I made to this thing. So our goal today is to start running some strings through this thing. And when we're running the strings through this thing, we're gonna follow a very similar uh, idea, a very similar workflow that we did on um, uh, the wiring of the harness, the, the, the work that we did down here. Oops. Uh, the work that we did down here when we were wiring the harness, if you remember, what we did was we stubbed this thing out. We created a series of stubs and we used those stubs to create the wiring harness. Well, we're going to do something very similar as we go in and create the strings for this thing. So if that sounds good to you, if you like what you're hearing, if you like what you're seeing, be sure to hit that like button, left mouse button on that, that like button. Let's take a look at the mouse cam here. Remember, you can just take your mouse over and left mouse button on that. Uh, like button and those likes really help with uh, the searchability of this video so that other people can learn lots of good SolidWorks tips and tricks. <laughs> so let's uh, let's get into it here. Let's talk about how we're going to do this. We're going to uh, quote unquote stub this thing out. And what I mean by that is we are going to go to this component here, which is a sub assembly of the bridge. And we're going to create some geometry in the sub assembly of the bridge that we're going to use to help define the strings. And so what we can do here is right at the bridge level, we could go to the command sketch 3D sketch and we can start creating a 3D sketch for the stub information. And so we're going to create a line here. I'm going to use the tab key to switch my 3D sketch uh, orientation. So I'm going to create a line here like this, a line here like this, a line here like this, and a line here like this. And these lines can each be essentially the same length as this um, uh, wall thickness here, which is 0 0.128. So I could just take one of those lines and make it uh, 0 0.128. I'll make it just a, a smidge larger, 0 0.130. And we'll take all of those and we'll make all of those equal. And then we're gonna take this point and make it on plane. And we're gonna take this point 
and make it on plane. On plane. And we're gonna take this point and make it on plane. And we're gonna take this point and make it on plane. Then we're gonna press F on our keyboard, which allows us to see uh, those sketch entities because they're like way out here in space. That'll happen sometimes. So we're gonna orient our views so that we can see those sketch entities and so that ideally we can also see the, uh, the cylinders in the model. Looks like we're gonna run into a little bit of a challenge there. That's okay. We'll just pick that one, rotate the view a little bit, pick this hole and make that concentric. And then we will uh, view zoom previous one of my favorite uh, commands that we've talked about in the series, Zoom Previous, is a huge time saver. So we'll take this guy, rotate the view a little bit, hold control, pick this, and make that concentric. We will Zoom Previous, take this guy, rotate the view a little bit, hold control, pick this guy, make it concentric, Zoom Previous. And we will finish up by taking this guy, rotate the view a little bit, hold control, pick this guy, and make concentric. So we just created the stubs moving through the hole there. And in the same 3D sketch, we could also create the stubs that are going through this, this part. But you know what? We have this part one, two, three, four times. Why not just make that uh, one single time in one of these parts and then show it in the other four? So I'm going to exit that sketch. I'm going to call this um, stubs in, uh, I'll call this stubs in bridge, plate, start of string. I don't need quite as much uh, definition there, but it's good good to have that. And then we're in a spot now that I'm, I'm glad we have a chance to talk about, and that is the, the spot of trying to create a um, sketch color parameter when you're working in an assembly. This is something that I've had a number of people ask me about over the years. Uh, I want to now right mouse button and do sketch color, but sketch color doesn't show up there. So what you need to do is go up to any one of your toolbars, right mouse button, and go to line format, line format. That will bring up a toolbar down here at the bottom. It's usually at the bottom left. And what you can do is you can select the 3D sketch out of the tree. There's a 3D sketch in the tree or any sketch when you're in an assembly. And then you can select this icon here, which is for uh, color or line property. It's like line properties or color, something like that. So I can pick on that 3D sketch and then I can pick this guy here for the uh, line properties line color and once I do that then I can choose to change the color of this sketch to something that really pops out like a magenta and there we go so the line color option uh, down here is what you need to use when you're trying to change the color of a sketch in an assembly you, you don't uh, just right mouse button and go to sketch color I think you can do it from feature properties too oh no can't do it from there okay okay so now we've got that sketch for the stubs let's open up this guy here and in this guy, what we're going to do is we're going to find the center of this little saddle here. Uh, let's say that the center of that is, let's see, we do have a sketch going through there. Let's see, what's that sketch plane? Edit sketch plane, it's on the right plane. Sweet, we're going right through the middle of this thing. So we can do select sketch, and then we could maybe even just take this path and do an offset entities um, and offset that a small amount. Um, Technically, this should probably be different for each of the strings, and we'd want to look at uh, a set of strings to determine what that difference should be. Um, you know what? I have many boxes of strings, so just stand by here for one moment. bin of uh, guitar guitar repair stuff. Duh. This is uh, everything that I need for guitar repair. Not everything, but a lot of the stuff that I have for guitar repair is in here. One of the things I have are tons of old bass strings. So this is a this is a set of uh, five five string bass. Sometimes you have five strings. And you can see I threw a little label on there because um, these were used. So basically you, you know, the strings wear out. I mean, they're metal and you're playing and your hand is like getting uh, uh, grease and stuff on it. So the strings get kind of dull over time. So you buy a new set, but you know, if you're ever playing a gig, it's better to have a dead string than to have no string if you 
uh, if you break a string in the middle of the gig. And so you can see on the back here, the uh, thickness of each of these strings, 0 0.045, 0 0.065, 0 0.085, 0 0.105. Pretty standard. Um, they, they, they come in, you know, slight variations, different players like different uh, thicknesses. You get different tone, you get different feel, you can play faster, slower. Uh, but pretty standard there. So what we could maybe do is create um, an offset from that sweep path and then use that offset for uh, our center line of what we're doing here. So that offset could maybe be at um, 0 0.045 over 2. Okay, so that could be one of our strings um, and so on and so on and so on. this song probably we want this to be almost vertical we actually probably want it to be a little bit probably want it to be just maybe like a few degrees i'll just make it vertical it'll be fine we're gonna be for what we're doing here we're gonna be fine whoops uh, make that horizontal. So I did a control Z. So, okay, this is another good spot to know about a great uh, time-saving workflow. Uh, this is going to actually be one of my upcoming power moves. So uh, what we could do is we could take this point here and this point here, and we can make them vertical. And then we realize that, oh, crud, that's supposed to be horizontal. Well, you can just press control Z. Just slow down a little bit. Press control Z. And then you can see that the, the um, context bar comes back. And so then you can just move your mouse over a little bit, go to horizontal, and then you're ready to move on. Uh, you don't have to you know, spend an exorbitant amount of time uh, trying to repair that issue. So these each increase by um, 20 thou in diameter. So that means that I could offset this by uh, 10 thou in uh, radius. So that's going to be uh, string two. And then I'll just press enter to repeat the previous command. Pick that, right mouse button. Press enter to repeat the previous command. Pick that, right mouse button to finish it. And then for this first offset, I'm going to make it just a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to make it 0 0.035. Going to make it just a little bit more. It's going to give us just a little bit of leeway as we are uh, running this route out. So this is gonna be called string stubs on saddle. And we are going to right mouse button here and hide the, the earlier sketch. And we're gonna right mouse button here. We're gonna say sketch color and we're gonna make that something that really pops out like this green, that green looks good. All righty, close that. There we go, that's exactly what we want there. So we've got our thickest string, then our next string, next string, next string, E, A, D, G, our four strings here. And so um, just as a, a little bit of a spoiler slash, uh, just so you guys understand what we're doing here, when we go into our top level assembly, we are going to 3D sketch at the top level of the assembly, take this entity and do a convert entities, take this entity and do a convert entities. And then we are going to create uh, some geometry that goes between them, like a spline, for example. We could create a spline here that goes between these two and then at each end of that spline, we can make it tangent. So tangent there and tangent there. Or we could do a fillet. Um, you know, it, it a fillet might actually look more realistic. Or, and this is what we're gonna we're gonna end up doing, honestly. Or we could just do a fit spline because uh, it's coming off of here. It's bending and then it's bending again. So when we do a fit spline in SolidWorks, what's important to know about fit spline in SolidWorks is that it will automate the creation of the fillets at the at the uh, intersection of the fit spline. So if you have something like this, and then you let's exit that sketch, and then you go from plane begin to sketch orient the view, and you do tools spline tools fit spline, one of my favorite commands in SolidWorks. Um, what you can do is you can pick here, 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 and SolidWorks will automate the creation of the fillets in the corner there. Now, you can kind of control what that fillet's gonna be by adjusting the tolerance here, but it's a little bit of a, a guessing game um, because it's not a true radius, it's a curvature continuous. 
But there you go. There you see now I've got a spline. And because there was a sharp corner here and we can't have a spline in the sharp corner, SolidWorks automatically created a fillet. Well, that's very useful when you're trying to route something like a string because you could get in here then and you, after you've created your geometry or maybe your layout for your geometry, you could get in here with fit spline. So tools, spline tools, fit spline. And you could say, I want to go from here to here and then over to here. And then you could say that I want that to be, uh, you know, my fit spline and you could, if you needed to, you could adjust what's going on in the corner here. And then you could use that as your sweep path. So now we're gonna be able to sweep our string all the way up through the entire bass guitar. So that's a little bit of a spoiler as to what we are doing with all this stub activity, but uh, hopefully that, that makes sense. And now everybody is aware of what we're doing. And that means that we need to stub the next location. And that next location is going to be the nut. So we're gonna open this part here and rinse and repeat, as I like to say. 3D sketch, line, start here, press tab, so we're going in the correct direction. Take this point, hold control, make that on plane. Take this point, hold control, make that on plane. Take this line, hold control, make that concentric. Yes, that looks excellent. I know that in the past we've done this and we've been able to kind of wake up the center point, so uh, I could certainly try that again, but I think I'm just gonna stick with this, this technique. I also know last time I just did a dimension on the one end. Um, you know, you could do, there's a lot of different ways. Lots of different ways to do this. If you get it, what I like to do is just get a workflow working and just stick with that workflow. You know, I know that it could be uh, not necessarily the most efficient workflow, but it's also something where I could spend an hour trying to save, you know, two minutes of time uh, where I could just brute force my way through it in 15 minutes. And so I'll just do the, the work. I don't mind doing the work. That's the thing. I really don't. I don't mind doing the work. Okay, this will be stubs. String stubs on nut, right mouse button, sketch color change the color here and then this might also be a good time to go through and you know rename if anything needs to be renamed this tree looks pretty good so I'm not gonna worry about it okay now we get to kind of the more interesting section of this challenge which is the the helices that are taking place here in the region of the um, of the strings and then the actual stub sticking out of the the uh, um, the string there. So let's do them one at a time. The stubs first, uh, because the stubs, I think we can just do once and we can have uh, and, and make use of it over and over again. And so what I mean by the stubs is if we're looking at this thing from a right side view, if I go to the um, right plane, begin a sketch, orient the view, I can create a line here that's going vertical and then uh, create a line here that's going horizontal. Now, generally when you're when you're uh, running a string around an instrument peg like this, there's a, a method you wanna use to keep the uh, to keep the string tight up against the post and to keep pressure going down to the bottom of the string. So I'll show you guys what I mean by that in a moment, but uh, what it comes down to is that generally speaking, you want this stub to uh, kind of be closer to the top section of the spring. So. We can actually probably get away with, uh... now I, I think I'm just gonna dimension this. I was gonna maybe consider trying to do something a little more dynamic, but I think at least for the first pass here, I'm just gonna create a dimension. And this is gonna be based on how that threaded section goes. Okay, that's fine. Just gonna, sometimes I'll just create everything right to the origin just to keep things uh, simple. So what happens is the string gets uh, placed in here and then run up. Um, it does have a slight bend here at the corner. So we'll just put that bend right on there, right in this sketch, uh, make things a little easier. Okay, and then this will be called string stub tuning post. I don't know why I'm putting in tuning post here. I Obviously I know what Part I'm in, so it doesn't seem really necessary. Sketch color, I'll uh, make this one, let's make it orange. That'll look really good with the wood behind it. A little sarcasm there. View, sketches. Okay, so now we've got our string stubs here. Now, I think that for each string, I'm gonna have to create the helix. 
uh, that's running up through here because I, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it in uh, in batch. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. Yeah, I think I'm just going to do it for each string. I think that's the way to go. So we're now ready to start creating the strings. So let's save this assembly. And I'm going to just uh, dial back some of the graphics settings here just to make it a little bit easier for me to um, see the sketch geometry and a little bit less taxing on my graphics card. Uh, keep things kind of moving along snappy. What's up, Brad? Welcome, welcome, welcome to the party. Cheers. All right, let's, uh, so let's get into it here. Insert component new part. And this component is going to be uh, called, what are we on here? Let's go sevens now. RBG-701-E string. So this is our E string here. And for the E string, we're gonna pick the front plane of the assembly because using this technique, we always just pick the front plane. Uh, and also because, you know, we're doing a three sketch, it doesn't matter anyway. So we'll exit that sketch. And then we are going to um, create an in-context feature here right on this um, right on this face here. So we're gonna select this face here, begin a sketch, orient our view, and we're gonna create a sketch of a circle uh, that is slightly larger than the tuning post. Really what we should probably do is just take the tuning post and uh, convert it and then we should offset that one half of the wire thickness. So 0 0.105 over two. Um, and then we'll make base construction. It's probably the right way to do it. I'm, I'm thinking about this stuff on the fly here a little bit, guys. So I apologize, but uh, Brad, what's up saying? Got that TTT shirt. Oh yeah. Glad that you like it. Glad that you got it. Thank you very much for repping it. I very much appreciate it. Guys, I'm going to go back here uh, one step. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create a new plane. Um, so S key reference geometry plane offset from this surface at this point. And then I'm going to use that to drive the helix uh, down. I think it's that's going to give us the best results here. Um, so now I'm going to edit this sketch plane and I'm going to put it on that new plane that I just created. Yeah, I like that a lot more. That's good. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this helix here and I'm, or I'm sorry, this curve here, uh, the, the circle, and I'm going to go to features, curves, helix and spiral. And we're going to set that pitch to be 0 0.105 over two. And maybe we should make it just a little bit more, uh, let's say like 60 thou, uh, reverse the direction of that. And we do want the string to come up and wind around kind of at this location. So the main things we need to look for here is uh, what is gonna be the start angle of this thing. So it looks like it's gotta be uh, close to, we want the start angle to be close to where the stub is here, right? So you can see here, we can just adjust this arrow and move that around. And we wanna remember, you know, what is fit spline going to do? Fit spline is going to take this geometry and blend it over to here. So fit spline is gonna put in that radius for us. So we don't want the start angle to be right here. You know, we want it to be a little bit further down the, the, the peg here. So, you know, we, this is this is uh, very much, we're doing this for aesthetic purposes. So eyeballing it up is totally legit in this case. Okay, and then for our revolutions here, we want this to come around maybe two times. Uh, you know, you wrap it around the peg two, three times. You should be pretty good there. So you can see where this is coming out here. And you want to imagine, once again, if we do fit spline, you know, if it comes off of here, is that going to look good when it comes down to there? It's probably going to look pretty good. I think it's probably going to look good. So now I'm going to hit the green check mark. And that creates our helix spiral in that region. Uh, let's do view curves. Make sure we can see that. That creates the helix spiral in that region. And so now we're going to go to sketch 3D sketch. And this is what I like to do. I like to take the stub convert entities, the helix, convert entities, the stub here, convert entities. Uh, I like to, to create a line between them. So a line that goes from here down to here. I like to take this stub here, the highest one for the thickest string, convert entities. This stub here, convert entities, create a line between them. The line that goes from here to here. 
and create a line that goes from here to here. And then I exit that 3D sketch at that point. Um, you could also certainly make the argument to like maybe throw in a little arc here or even a spline between these two. Um, it's not necessary, but you could, you know, like I said, you could do it. So I could take these two and make them tangent and then take these two and make them tangent. Um, it's not necessary because fit spline will do this for you, but you could certainly do this if you wanted, if you were, maybe if you were struggling, if it was, if it was being problematic, you could maybe, uh, do this just to kind of help things out. I'll do this one with that extra nub and then I'll do the next one without it. So now I'm going to exit sketch and then I'm going to go down to this region down here and I'm going to do S key reference geometry plane. And I'm going to make a new plane here and that's going to be for my, um, Diameter. I'm doing this wrong, guys. I'm sorry. I jumped. I jumped the gun. Exit that sketch. So this will be called E string layout. So again, we're using layout sketches here. And then I would 3D sketch. And I would right mouse button select chain. Let's go here to this line here. Right mouse button select. I can't select chain. Come on. There we go, select chain. And then I would tools, spline tools, fit spline. And what that does is it just kind of smooths everything out. If there's any sharp corners, if anything's not exactly tangent, you know, if you imagine when this string comes up to this location, it's gonna run into this thing. Uh, it's not gonna be exactly tangent. Well, fit spline will fix that. Uh, when it runs into this helix here, it's not going to be exactly tangent. Well, fit spline will fit that. Now, you may have to adjust your tolerance here. So you notice my tolerance was high. The fit spline was trying to shortcut uh, and go around to this region. So just dial down your tolerance a little if that's happening. Hit the green check mark. There we go. There's our fit spline for our string. And now we can exit that sketch and we can say... Um, uh, we can hide our layout. We can say S key reference geometry plane. We can take not that, but this and this and make a new plane perpendicular to the curve at the end point. We can select that plane, begin a sketch. Sorry guys, I know I'm underneath the, the keyboard cam, but I'm trying to kind of talk through what I'm doing. 0 0.105 because that's the diameter of our E string. Exit that sketch and then we can choose to sweep that surface, uh, sorry, that circle along that path. So, oops, along that path. And there we go. That looks like a string to me. Although it looks almost like it's... Oh, I did the pitch wrong on the, the helix. Ah! <laughs> yeah, I did the pitch wrong on the helix. I did the pitch as ha one half of the... Um, one half of the the uh, string thickness. So I should, I did this at 0 0.060. I should have done it like 0 0.120. Um, and so this should be 1.25, cut that in half as well. Maybe come up a little further so it's going around the corner. I could maybe go around one more time. I think that's gonna get. Eesh. I'd love to have that thing come around twice, but I feel like we're gonna run into that nut at the bottom, it's not gonna look good. It's so close, man, it's so close. I'm just gonna do it, uh, you know, 1.5. Just gonna go around once on that one, that's okay. Hopefully it doesn't come out of tune, right? Okay, and then you can see here, obviously this is not tangent uh, with our our 3D sketch coming in there. Um, and that's okay uh, because the fit spline will help, will will smooth that out. So like the original sketch was coming in not tangent, but the fit spline smoothed it out. I very much appreciate that when I made that change to the helix, the fit spline was able just to repair itself uh, and keep moving forward. That's pretty sweet. So now we'll take this and this and we'll do a sweep. And that looks better. I think we like that. And so we can hit the green check mark. Oh, what are we still running into ourselves here a little bit? 
uh, maybe just a tiny bit. I think I can make this diameter for the helix a little smaller too, huh? Since it's on that peg at that lower section. And then maybe the helix pitch just a little bit, a little bit larger. Make sure we don't run into ourselves there. Still hitting an error, huh? Is it this corner? Yeah, it's this corner. Don't like that corner, it's too tight. Okay, no problem. So we can, we can adjust. Um, we can get a sketch here, bring this in a little bit. Let's see if that's sufficient. Weird wrinkle there, huh? I think that's. Oh, is it? Is it maybe that other corner as well? Just trying to troubleshoot here to see where the. I mean, we definitely have clearance there. See where the intersection is, you know. This might be easier to do also if I open up the model into its own window. I think everything down there is pretty good. Might as well do this as like a divide and conquer also where we can uh, eliminate some of the geometry um, and then rerun the fit spline and then see if we get better results. So we could go here to the fit spline. Let's rename this to half fit spline and then we'll edit that sketch and let's delete the fit spline and then let's um, recreate it but we're going to just get rid of some of the geometry so we'll do everything down to here. Tools, spline tools, fit spline. And let's see if we get any better luck with that. I know that plane definition is a little bit off, but I don't think it's gonna stop us from sweeping it. Okay, good. So that tells us where the problematic region is. Uh, the problematic region is just this, this extra stuff that we're doing here. Um, and so now we can, you know, we can adjust accordingly. So control Z to undo that, uh, controls. I wonder how far back I can control Z this thing. Can I go back to when I had the full fit spline? I sure can, that's pretty nice. So the other really nice thing about fit spline is that if I go to this sketch here, which is the sketch of the stub, and I edit that sketch. So if I make this 0 0.085, let's give ourselves a little more radius there, or even 0 0.1. The fit, the underlying fit spline updates. So um, very nice bit of functionality there uh, to allow us to just continue to kind of do some iterative troubleshooting um, to try to get this thing to stop wrinkling in that final final region because we're so close to having this thing done so now we can try this once more we know right where the problem is man it's just that final wrap it just does not like that final wrap we could kind of do the same thing if we were to um Just remove this this uh, downward section to see if that's the problem. But I feel like I'm I'm so close here. I'm just gonna keep subtly massaging this. And this, in theory, this will be the most difficult one because it's got the largest diameter. So hopefully, if I can Whoop, zoom previous, if that ever happens. Remember, especially in assemblies, zoom previous is your best friend.
So we'll go here, features. I like the song. The song's like getting me in the mood to, to do this right. Sometimes in the options here, you can do like minimize twist. That sometimes helps too. Okay, not helping this time. We know right where the problem is, so. Let's open up this part and do a uh, quick sanity check on this part. So we'll go to this point here and then we will sketch a 0 0.105 diameter circle there and try to sweep it along that path, the, the string stub. And this will help us uh, confirm that, yeah, that sweep works fine. Let's just make sure that we got, uh, uh, don't merge the results. Yeah, I figured that would work fine. Let's dial that string stub diameter down and just make sure that We're giving ourselves the maximum uh, opportunity in the, yeah, okay, that's good. In the um, fit spline for that that blend to the fit spline. So, all right, that's good. So we confirm that this the sweep works fine in that region. We're just struggling with that blend. It's just the the blend right here, which is, you know, I I get it. Uh, I don't like it, but I get it. Make your helix diameter a hair bigger. That might help as well. Okay, I like that. There's a hair, five thou. <laughs> Let's get one way out of here. I know the fit spline is relying on that, but I need to be able to move that point over. It's kind of interesting. It's still showing the the helix sticking out the end there. Okay, there we go. All right. Let's redo the fit spline. Tools, spine tools, fit spine. I used a select chain there to get that. Now, just again for a sanity check, I think I'm going to um, dial the diameter down of the circle here. Um, this is just a good, you know, my. I'm pretty sure that what's happening is the uh, the sweep's just running into itself. So this is just a good way to make sure that you are um, not overlooking something. That's kind of interesting. That's not where the where I was expecting that to. Oh, not on that line. No, on the fit spline. Right mouse button, select other. Let's get the fit spline. There we go. Okay. Now let's see if that works. Yeah. Okay. So now it's just a matter of, uh, you know, dialing this up until. Till it fails. Just worked. Okay, and then it failed there. The other nice thing about doing it that way is you can, um, now we've got the sweep there. We don't have to keep going back and creating the sweep. Now we can just kind of massage this until we get, uh, until we get the, the fit spline to work. Yeah, 
I think it's going to be... this value here. Wish I could drive that back with like an angle dimension or something. Keeps wanting to... Keeps not wanting to let me move that point. Fits fine still on there, right? Oops. The layout. The layout. Oh, you, I guess I just had to press the button harder. <laughs> it's kind of interesting too here. Like this is, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be tangent. Okay, let's progress yeah how far up can we take it with that progress that excellent progress we just made ah Just a game, a game of millimeters, right? All right, well, I think what I'll do is I'll get in there and mess around with that one uh, off hours. But uh, overall, I got to say, I feel like I'm pretty happy with that. I think that's uh, that's definitely passable. I like the way it looks as it's wrapping around that. And you can see how using fit spline allows you to kind of start out with sharper geometry and then let the geometry just, um, you know, roll over the... Um, you know, roll over that, those areas where it's transitioning. So we're gonna move on, we're gonna do some of the other strings, but let's do one last thing here with this string. Let's open it up into its own window. Let's do a control Q to get everything to rebuild and let's just go through and do some cleanup. So we're gonna hide this the sketch, hide the uh, helix, hide the extra plane here. This is gonna be E string sweep. I know that the diameter is not correct at the moment. Uh, let's add this to our vault. We're going to check in active document. And final thing here is deciding what we want that texture to look like. And uh, we talked earlier in the uh, in this series about how to use a custom material. And we can certainly go that route. But a lot of times you can find a material in the library that'll, um, that'll you know, get you close. And it doesn't necessarily have to be something that you would expect. So like this wood floor material uh, might look a little bit weird in this, this current orientation. But if we were to go to advanced and maybe change the mapping here to surface and maybe change the scale of this thing, you can, you know, you can kind of see that you can start to get it to look, you know, sort of like a string. I know it's not the right color, but uh, um, sometimes you do have the option to adjust color or adjust multiple colors. I don't think we're going to be able to get there with this particular one, uh, but because uh, it's got too much of that wood grain in the embedded in the image. But there may be things in here like in stone that can get it to look, you know, kind of like a string. So if you're just looking at this thing on the fly, you can see it. Uh, and it looks like a string. You could also take a photograph of an existing string, or you could go online. You could see if you could find a texture uh, for a string. So let's see if we can if we can get any luck with that. If we were to go online and try to find a string texture. So here, what I did was I looked for uh, base string texture. Uh, looking for images. Sometimes it's helpful if you do tileable. I don't know if it's T I L E or, yeah, it is T I L E. Sometimes you'll find an image that you can just drop on there uh, that'll look good, but it doesn't seem like I'm really having any luck on that front. So let me go back to what I had originally. And um, what we could do here is we could maybe take one of these images and put it into our photo editor and see if we can't create our own custom texture. So let's start with this one here. Um, I like this one. I like the way it's got the, uh, the, 
the peaks and valleys, if you will. Um, so I'm going to jump into my photo editing software. And paste that image down. And what we want is, you know, just like we were doing when we were taking our own photographs, first of all, we want to ensure that we've got more or less on our orthogonal view of this thing. So we're just going to sketch in a horizontal line and then we can do a move here to get this thing to uh, move into the correct spot. Okay, that seems like it's more or less horizontal. And uh, then what we could do is we could take this geometry and ensure that it is tileable, which is to say that we would want to crop the image uh, in a way that it can be pasted and repasted, and uh, you know we can we can uh, give ourselves the best uh, the best chance of having a good result. I don't think we're really going to get that good of a result from this, but again, it's just meant to to help you guys understand how you could do this. Really, I mean, looking at this one here, I almost just want to create an image that has some horizontal lines, uh, uh, make them at a slight angle, and then just use that as my uh, as my skin here for this, but uh, let's let's work with the image that we got here first of all, and then we'll see we'll we'll see about that other approach. So we'll do image crop to selection. Uh, let's get this thing nice and tight here. Image crop to selection, and then we're gonna get rid of that extra layer that had our uh, our extra color on it. And then we're going to take this image and just make sure that we're getting it from a peak to a peak, so that it's more or less tileable. There's some other tricks you can use to kind of create your own tileable images, but uh, this should, again, we're just trying to get close on this thing. And then we'll do file save as. Let me just make sure that I'm saving this into the right spot here, guys. So we'll do file save as, go into our base guitar giveaway. And we'll do this as um, base textures and appearances. We'll call this base string one. And then we are going to go back into SolidWorks and we're going to say that we want to, uh, in our appearance option, so we just click the beach ball up here at the top of the screen. In our appearance option, we can say that our appearance path file is going to be browse. Actually, this might, I don't know if it uses any of the underlying um, reflection uh, and shininess options, but it might make sense to first assign some type of a, a metal material or a shiny material to this and then go in and apply uh, so let me just make this like a polished steel. Okay. And then I'll click the beach ball and I'll go to property, uh, browse. And I'm going to go to my red base giveaway. And we're going to go to our base textures and appearances. And we're going to say all appearance or all image files. We're going to use this base string texture. And we're going to say that we're going to save that as, a. uh, uh image map using the SOLIDWORKS image match op map option. And we'll say this is gonna be a surface and let's adjust that angle to 90. Oh, that looks okay. Yeah, that looks okay. Better than I thought it was gonna look, that's for sure. So you can adjust the scaling here to uh, maybe get a different different result, but that, that, that result that came up was okay. Like I said, I think I might be just as good uh, going in and creating a new custom texture where I just create some horizontal lines. So let's kind of take a look at that as well. So let's go back here. Uh, let's do a control Z here. Okay. And let's make a new layer here. I'm going to take the uh, color selector option and kind of get this gray color here. I think that looks good. And then I'll drop that in the background. Okay. So that's that gray color that I grabbed from this one. And then I'm going to uh, make another layer. And on this layer, I'm gonna use the option for render grid. And I'll say that my grid spacing uh, for vertical spacing is gonna be, well, horizontal spacing, I'll make that a lot. And that way I mainly just have the, oh wait, no, I want that to be less. So I'll make that less and then we'll make this a lot. So I don't have that many vertical spacings. Uh, max I can do is 100, okay. And then I'll say, okay. And then I'll just take that whole grid and make it larger. Like so. And then, oh, you know what? Sorry guys, I, did, I messed up here. Uh, effects, render, grid. I want that to be black. 
render grid. And we'll make that black. That looks like that'll do. And then we will increase the size of the grid and change the angle of these grid lines a little bit. Looks good. Something like that. And that'll probably do. And then um, I can just crop that region. So something like this, trying to get any of those vertical lines that I had to put in image, crop to selection, and then I'll get rid of this layer with the image. Nope. Get rid of this layer with the image and get rid of this layer with the image. And that leaves us just with this shape here. And then I could do uh, file, save as, save this as a PNG call this base string two and save. And then I could go back to the base string here and say appearance and browse and all images base string two. And in mapping, let's set that to surface. And then again, we might need to adjust the angle of that thing to get us those lines looking a little bit more like a base string. Yeah, that's good. That'll work. Dial this down a little bit. There it is. It's a it's a flat wound base string. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, that'll definitely pass. You know, we could certainly we, we would want to get in there and make sure the image uh, is a little bit better at being tiled and doesn't end up with these weird like anomalies in the surface. But that is a uh, base string with a custom texture. Certainly that'll pass uh, here in our uh, in our overall view. And so we can take, what do we got here? We got another graphical anomaly. Might need to re-render. Re this happens sometimes, right? You get this weird like sweep path uh, graphical anomaly. Sometimes what I'll do to fix that is I'll just edit the sweep. And then a lot of times that'll be enough to get it to go away. Doesn't look like it's going away. We're just stuck with it forever. We're gonna always see the center line of that sweet path. Thank you, SolidWorks. Thank you. <laughs> see. Yeah, that's just gonna be that's just part of our design now. Let's see, save. Close. Reopen. This is the kind of stuff that I always see on the message boards. People are like, why does it do this? I don't know. It just does it because it's software. Because a human coded it and they probably made a mistake somewhere in the code. That's that's the answer. That's the, really the only answer. All right, cool. That looks pretty good. I like that. Um, I do kind of wish it was a little bit tighter on that peg. I, I may try to clean that up a little bit later. Um, but overall, I think that looks pretty good. Uh, definitely, if you're if you're viewing it from here, it's gonna look good. If you're doing like renderings, looking down the headstock, it's gonna look good. You know, I love the way Fit Spline kind of it almost kind of gives you that organic look of uh, the string bending into the right spot. So I like that. You know, obviously I can clean up the texture a little bit too. That was just like a quick. 30 second pass for that texture. We can look up stuff. If you guys like that, be sure to hit the like button. Let's do one more string today and then I'm gonna go because uh, it's really starting to get cold. I think it's gonna start snowing soon. Thank you, Tambor Station. Appreciate the feedback. Here we go, rinse and repeat, right? My favorite thing to say. View, curves, view, sketches, insert, component, new part, RBG. Seven, zero, two, A string. Pick the front plane of the overall assembly. Immediately exit that sketch. Begin a new 3D sketch. We can take this guy and convert it. We can take this second thickest stub and convert it. And we can draw a, either a spline or a line between them. We can just draw a line between them. Draw a line between them. Oh, and by the way, of course, at the bottom of this string, there's a little, um, looks kind of like an eye hook. So I'll model that up as well. Um, probably after hours. 
take this stub here, convert, create a line between them. go and now we are ready to start doing some of that work on the helix up top here uh, we could take in the you know for the short term we could take this this and this convert kind of jumped the gun a little bit on that convert i know i should have done should have done this first so s key reference geometry plane parallel to this face at this point on that plane begin a sketch Take uh, this diameter and convert it. Offset that slightly. Take that curve, use the helix spiral command found in features. Once we do that helix and spiral command, we want to start out by looking at the starting angle. We want that starting angle to be close to this orange stub that we're looking at with a little bit of additional for the radius that's gonna be coming off of that orange stub. So we could do something like this. That's probably pretty good. Yeah, that's good. Um, we want the end angle here uh, to be something that's gonna you know, come down and connect to our stub here. So if we were to look at this thing in a in a top view, you can see what that end angle looks like. That's pretty good there. It pretty much the A string pretty much just comes straight up and runs right into it. I remember Brian May, the Red Special. Uh, if you if you ever watched that, the, the guitar player from Queen, he talked about how he wanted all his strings to be going exactly straight when they went into the tuning heads and so that's why his uh that's why he used the v headstock uh it was very important to him for tuning reasons he wanted to make sure that it stayed in tune tuning intonation reasons i feel like once again that helix is out a little far but it's all right i'm gonna keep moving so here in our 3d sketch now we're gonna edit sketch we're gonna take that helix and we are going to Oh, you know what? This string is so much smaller. Maybe I could get away with uh, running that one around twice. So the pitch for this one should be closer to 0 0.095. I'll bet you I can get away with taking this one all the way around twice. Oh, yeah. That looks good. Really, I mean, at that point, it should probably be even like a variable pitch helix where it tapers in a little bit, a variable uh, diameter. So it tapers in a little bit and then it comes out. Um, I don't know if I want to go that far with this thing. This is interesting. It's like tapering in. Yeah, I'm not going to go that far with it. Not today. Maybe I'll do that. That'll be like my after hours special. That'll just be for uh, the only, only fans or whatever it is. Only friends. Only fans. Just kidding, guys. I don't have an only fans. Just in case you were wondering. And if you don't know what that is, don't look it up. You don't want to know. Okay, here we go. Let's edit this sketch and let's make that a convert entities. Let's bring this back just a little bit like we did last time. This time we're just gonna jump that gap with the fit spline and let's finish up here with a line that connects these two. Okay, and then we're gonna exit sketch and we're gonna do um, 3D sketch again. And we're gonna do tools, spline tools, fit spline. We're gonna right mouse button, select chain. We're gonna right mouse button. We're gonna cancel that command. We're gonna right mouse button, select chain. Then we're gonna do tools, spline tools, fit spline. Remember, if you're using these commands over and over again, you can always add them to like your S key menu. Or you can always use recent commands, something like that. Okay, so there's a fit spline ripping up through there. And now we're gonna jump the gap with the fit spline. So we're gonna go from here to uh, I want it to be into this one. To here. See and see how the fit spline jumped the gap for us? That's the cool thing about fit spline. Uh, is that it'll jump the gap and it'll add in 
the radius there for us automatically. Now we don't have as much control over that radius like we did in the last example with the E string, but it is pretty cool that it can jump the gap. Whoops, look, I ended up shortcutting this too much. I should have adjusted the tolerance on that thing. So control Z and let's do tools, spline tools, fit spline. And then let's adjust the tolerance here. Okay, so how closely is the spline matching the existing geometry? And that's kind of like, how tight are the radii going to be? It's, you can think of that as like, how tight are the radii going to be? Okay, and now let's see if that fit spline is uh, successful in creating our sweep. So we're gonna pick the fit spline. Let's hide that layout sketch. We're gonna pick the fit spline. We're gonna pick the endpoint. S key, reference geometry plane. That's gonna be the plane for our sweep profile. Begin a sketch on that plane. That's gonna be a circle with a diameter of 0 0.085. A little bit of a smaller string this time, so hopefully that'll be more successful. And features sweep. And so we can see we are now sweeping that string, that, that diameter along this entire fit spline that we just created, including these loops up here, which look awesome. And then down into that little hole that you use when you're loading up your strings. Oh, we hit another snag. I think for this one, um, again, you know, I know last time I said I was going to show you how the fit spline jumps the gap. And now I have shown you that, but I think I'm going to just use the radius uh, instead of using the jump the gap method, because when you use the radius, you can just a little bit more explicitly control what's going on. I think uh, also kind of on that same note, I'm gonna, yeah, maybe I'm not gonna bring it up. All right, so let's, yeah, if I delete that fit spine, I kind of lose everything, right? So let's go back here. Let's go back to this 3D sketch. And a sketch, and let's take this guy and well, that's the that's the fit spline, right? Let's take this guy. Listen, that saxophone. This guy's going crazy. Bring this back a little, just like we did last time. Maybe. Sometimes I'll just draw an extra entity here, like a line, and then I'll trim to that line. Sometimes you could also do a right mouse button, sketch tools, split. Where is it? Right mouse button. Sketch tools. Where's my sketch tools? Split. Here it is, split entities. And then I can maybe take that and delete it. And then spline from here to here. This is very similar to the challenge we ran into last time where we were trying to get this to have enough curvature to avoid erroring when we create that sweep. I don't know why sometimes you can just pick the point and sometimes you have to pick the point and uh, or you have to pick the curve and the point. It's kind of weird. All right. Fingers crossed. this show this right mouse button select chain uh, I'm just gonna do a right mouse button no, right mouse button select chain and then right mouse button in the background recent commands fit spline great it's not even in there <laughs> tools spine tools fit spline Adjust my tolerance here so that I'm not shortcutting right through the tuning peg. Hit the green check mark. Exit that sketch. Roll forward here. I know our plane definition is going to go a little wonky, but that shouldn't prevent us from at least trying to sweep this thing. There we go. First try. First try. That's what it's all about, baby. All right. And now let's fix that. Uh, I'm going to control Z it and just fix that uh, plane definition real quick. 
I did a control Z there because it's easier to still be able to see the spline. If it's embedded in the sweep, it's going to be harder to see the spline. So, so that's going to be this. There we go. And now we can take this, this sweep, green check mark, boom. And that is our A string. And that looks pretty darn epic. I'm happy with that one. So we could open that up into its own window. We could um, control Q, start hiding some stuff here, hide this, hide this, you know, go through, rename. Um, and this is string sweep A string. The emerger, what's up, what's up, what's up? Um, just because we're we're having fun with this, we can do base string two. Is that our? Oh yeah, that looks good. Uh, appearance. Actually, let's make this out of our steel first. Base string two, and we can go appearance, and we can say mapping surface, and adjust the angle here, and adjust the scale a little bit since this is an A string. It actually, looks okay. <laughs> I mean, I know it looks a little bit weird up here, but. Uh, overall, it looks okay. I'll change it eventually. All right, guys. Well, listen. We've come this far. You know, I feel like I should just speed run these last two. I think the last two are going to be easier because the diameter is so much smaller. So, let's go. Let's do it. Let's just do it. All right? Hit that like button if you want to see me speed run these last two. Uh, last two strings, but I got a, a like button over here. I can hit it. Let's go, like button. Oh, I lost my mouse. There we go. There we go. There we go. That's what we wanted to see. All right, let's speed run these last two. So here we go. We're gonna, we've now created the string for the E string. We've created the string for the A string. If you want to go back and watch those, uh, watch the full video, you can see how we created these strings, uh, how we were able to use a fit spline to get up there, and how we were able to create this beautiful custom texture uh, that we will probably improve a little bit on considering this is the custom texture right here. But let's go through the process now and create the D string. So. Insert, component, new part. We're gonna pick the new part named, or we're gonna name this new part 0703D string. Save. We're gonna pick the front plane of the assembly for our sketch plane, and we're gonna immediately exit that sketch because we are gonna be working with a helix down here at this end. So we're going to S key, reference geometry, plane, and we're gonna pick this plane and this point to offset that plane up to that point of the stub that we created as a 2D sketch inside of this part. Then we are going to begin a sketch on that plane and we are going to capture something close to the diameter of this tuning post. Uh, maybe it doesn't need to be uh, quite that size exactly. Maybe we'll go offset just a little bit uh, considering the diameter of the string as part of our offset distance. We will exit that sketch and we will use that sketch for the command curve, helix, and spiral. Now the pitch of this is gonna be a little bit more than the diameter of the string. The diameter string is 0 0.065. So we'll make this maybe 0 0.072, just a little bit more than that. Um, and this one is gonna actually be winding the other way uh, because the string is gonna come up here from the nut. It's going to come up and it's going to hit the string here and then wind around. So we wanna figure out where the, the stub is coming off here. That's where the stub is coming off. And we wanna use that to help dictate the starting angle for our helix. It's all the way on the other side. So let's bring this around. We can hold that button down. We can take a sip of our coffee. And there we go. And then, and why, you know, why did I stop it here when it's gonna be going all the way around this way? Well, we're going the wrong way with the helix. So we gotta make that counterclockwise. So that's why I stopped there. Um, so this is gonna blend from here to here. It's gonna come out, it's gonna wrap around this way a couple of times, and then it's gonna come down to the nut. And so we need to figure out what the stop angle for that helix needs to be. Let's increase this a little bit for our stop angle. And I think that's a little too far, 2.5, not quite far enough. Let's go 2.6, perfect, perfect. And we'll let the, th eh, maybe just a smidge more. 2.6, 0.3, no, 2.63. Um, and we'll let the the uh, fit spline kind of 
fix the rest of that. If that's off a little bit, we'll let the fit spline fix it. So now we're gonna create what we call a, a layout sketch for our fit spline. And you could certainly do that all in one 3D sketch. I do it in two separate sketches because as you saw earlier in the video, it's easier when you have problems to edit that underlying layout sketch. Uh, so let's create an underlying layout sketch here, sketch, 3D sketch, and this is gonna be using the convert entities tool here convert entities using the convert entities tool here this is the thinnest string this is the second thinnest string convert those two we'll use a simple line command in this 3d sketch to connect these two stubs so connect between there and there and you want to remember that when we go into our fit spline command tools spline tools fit spline these sharp corners are going to be rounded off automatically by the fit spline so it's no longer going to be sharp it's going to be rounded off nice and smooth there Victor K in the chat. What's up, Victor? How you doing? Welcome to the party. We're running the we're running the D string, as they say on the on the streets these days. All the kids are saying that. What are you doing this weekend? We're running the D string. That's right. All right, so we're gonna now run this stub down here, following the same technique, just a simple straight line in the 3D sketch. And then in the 3D sketch, we're gonna get to the uh, slightly more complicated section where we're gonna take this helix and we're gonna convert it. And we're gonna run a line from this endpoint of the helix to this endpoint here where we're passing through the nut. And then we are going to create a convert entities here. So we're gonna convert this and this and this uh, from the, uh, the underlying 2D sketch that's in that tuning post. And then we're gonna try to create a nice smooth blend here between these two. So we'll just bring this back a little bit. If you can't drag that point back, you might be able to do a right mouse button and do a split entities on here. Um, sometimes, whoops, let's remember we can use Zoom Previous. If you ever kick your model off the view, Zoom Previous is a huge uh, time saver. Uh, sometimes it helps if you just rotate the view a little. Right mouse button here, and we'll go to Sketch Tools, Split Entities. And look, no parking, no parking, no parking, parking. That's what we want, parking. So no parking, no parking, parking. So we'll split that entity there and maybe get rid of a little piece of that. Uh, and then we will create a spline that goes from this point to this point. Now we can grab the spline handles here to make the, the curvature that we need to finish off that blend into that string uh, tuning post. And then we can make this tangent and we can make these tangent as well. That looks pretty good for our layout for our fit spline. Let's exit that sketch. We're gonna right mouse button on one of those sketch entities and choose select chain. Hopefully to get the entire thing. Right mouse button, select chain. Okay, there we go. Wait, no, that's not it. Okay, there we go. Just a little highlighting issue there. Tools, spline tools, fit spline. So um, I think what, Probably before I get started here, I need to start a new 3D sketch, right? We have one 3D sketch here, uh, which is for our layout. We do need another 3D sketch. So begin a new 3D sketch, right mouse button, select chain, and then we're gonna go to tools, spline tools, fit spline. And we just want to examine the transition area here. You'll notice that uh, because of the, the fit spline tolerance, the spline is kind of shortcutting here. It's jumping right from this point over to this point. So what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, decrease that tolerance. And you can see that the spline now wants to follow a little more closely to the underlying geometry, and that's what we want. So we hit the green check mark, and that gives us essentially the path for our string. Look at that, it's gonna wind around a couple times. It's gonna look good. It's gonna come right up here over the nut. That's gonna look good and it's going to roll down here to the end. I think that's gonna look good too. So let's exit that 3D sketch. Let's hide the underlying geometry. Let's pick that spline up in this region. Let's hold control, we'll pick this point, and we're gonna to go to uh, reference geometry, plane. That's gonna make a new plane normal to that curve at the end point. That's gonna be our plane for our sketch for our diameter circle. And that circle diameter is going to be uh, 0 0.065 for the D string and we're going to exit that sketch we will pick that sketch of the circle pick the uh, 3D sketch and go to features sweep and cross our fingers hit the green check mark oh yeah that's what we wanted boom that is how you run a D string 
that's how you route your D string. Beautiful, beautiful. Let's do one more here, but what do you guys think? If you guys like that one, be sure to hit the like button. Be sure to subscribe. Be sure to buy a t-shirt, right? The new, the new Too Tall Toby t-shirts are available. You don't want one of these old t-shirts that falls apart. You want the brand new t-shirt. So be sure to pick up a new t-shirt and be sure to check out all of my other cool tutorial videos. All right, let's speed run this last string. Hopefully I can use that last little segment, the D string as a, a clip. That's why I, I, sh I shifted into teacher mode there for a minute, guys. I'm sure you guys who have been long time watching me, you noticed that. This time we'll just blast through it. Repeated a bunch of stuff that I said before. I don't need to do that, not for you guys. Insert component, new part. Victor K. Victor K says, don't need to separate don't need the separate sketch for circular cross-section sweep, can just define the diameter in the sweep feature. What do you guys think, chat? Somebody wants to answer Victor K? You guys can tell him, you guys can let him know what you think about that. Great tip. Yeah, that is a great tip. E-A-D-G. <laughs> Been playing for many, many years. I still have to say him from the start. <laughs> It's like every good boy does fine. I still have to say it whenever I look at the staff. Okay, 704 G string. Okay, front plane. And then we're gonna immediately exit that sketch. And uh, Victor, I will. if nobody in the chat reveals the answer to you, I will reveal the answer when I get to that step. Uh, so front plane to get a sketch. Oh no, no, front, pick the front plane of the assembly, immediately exit the sketch, go up here to this section, uh, S key reference geometry plane, select this plane, this face, select this point. Uh, we will hit the green check mark to give ourselves a sketch plane, select a, that sketch plane, begin a circle, convert this peg here, offset that circle slightly for the diameter of our new one. I'm just gonna make this 10 thou. Features, curves, helix and spiral. Uh, let's see here, where's our starting point? This one's gonna wrap around this way again. Very similar to how the last one did. Eh, that's probably good. Maybe I'll go just a little further. Just give me a little bit of room for that blend, that final blend. Um, and then our number of revolutions, 2.7, 2.72. Nope, good guess, Victor, but that is not correct. There it is, Brad's got it. There you go, Robert G has it, you guys know. I'm using my favorite build of SolidWorks, and unfortunately there's there's like uh, 10 features that have been added since SolidWorks 2015 that I wish I had. Yeah, I'm old school. I like the snappiness. That's really what it comes down to. It's snappy, it's reliable, it um, almost never crashes. I think I've had one crash uh, since I started live streaming this bass guitar, and it was uh, it was negligible. It was like right when we were starting the session, I went to do something and it crashed. It wasn't even in the middle of anything, so. Super reliable, and that's what I need when I'm doing hourly work. I don't need, I don't need, uh, yeah, I don't need anything that's gonna get too unstable. 0 0.055. See, we could, really, we could probably run this one around one extra time if we wanted to, just to kind of show off. Something like that. I don't know, it might be cool to have them, you know, have each of them with different numbers of wraps. It might look kind of cool. I think I'll do that. Okay, check mark. And now we are ready to go into sketch, 3D sketch, and start kind of stubbing this thing out, planning this thing out. So we'll do a convert entities on the helix. We'll do a convert entity, right mouse button select chain, convert entities on that. We can bring this guy back a little bit. Uh, the helix, I think I've already brought that back pretty far in the planning, so hopefully I can just do a spline here, especially considering how thin this string is. I should be okay doing it this way. So we'll go tangent, we'll go tangent. Running, I'm sure you guys, the guys at SolidWorks can help you out with the stable machine for 20 minutes. I don't think it's the machine, bro, unfortunately. I wish I could say that that's all it was, but... Um, you know, I have, and I have all the new builds. Like I do use the new builds. Um, and it's not, and it's not just the stability, like uh, as far as crashing goes, it's just, I just feel like the new ones have, um, I hate to say it, but kind of like bloat, bloatware. 
Like that's what it feels like. It just feels like there's a lot of extra stuff that uh, that doesn't need to be there. And I'm not even talking about the add-ins. I'm just talking about general snappiness. Like when I click new, you know, or edit sketch, or something like that. Like it's just, you know, I did a lot of auditing um, between uh, version 2020, 2021, and 2015 in prep for things like the tournaments and stuff like that. And that's, um, you know, that's just kind of how how it felt. It just felt like real, real bloaty. You gotta go with your gut sometimes, right? Look at that, that looks awesome. X is sketch, we'll do a new 3D sketch. We'll do a right mouse button, select chain, and we'll do a tools, spline tools, fit spline. Let's take a look at our tolerance for this fit spine. Look, it's like totally missing one full loop. That's not good. Dial the tolerance down. There we go. You always want to take a moment and look at that tolerance to make sure that you're uh, getting the expected results. Hit the green check mark. All right, that looks good. And exit sketch. I guess the other question, you know, just to, to circle back to, to what you're saying there, Victor, would be like, what, do, in your opinion, uh, what features have been added to 2023 that would uh, that would make it a game changer? Or, you know, that would justify, you know, like, if it was a hardware thing that would justify the need for new hardware, that could be another way of thinking about that question. Um, you know, I know most of the stuff that's new and... It's, uh, it's hard to, for me, to talk, in my brain, just in my brain, just in my opinion, it's hard for me to make the case that there's enough new stuff uh, to justify the, uh, not the financial cost, but just the performance cost. If it's going to, you know, be taken up more time, it should have some, like, real, real intense uh, justification for for that time the time really look at that first try uh, that thing came out awesome i love the way that looks with the four wraps that's great rocking 2020 yeah i think 2020 I, I use 2020 a lot too that what you just that last comment that you made there victor i uh completely echo that sentiment i'm kind of like i came out here to see like something really like Show me something really cool that got added to sheet metal or show me something really cool. I mean, I will say the structure system is definitely cool in weldments, um, you know, but you know, I can rock old weldments pretty solid too. So uh, it is cool. I, you know, I'm not gonna knock it, but is it, is it enough? That's the question. And if I, if I come to a what's new for SolidWorks, like I wanna see what's new in SolidWorks. I think that's more, more how I feel sometimes too. Uh, let's see here. This is, I don't know why I'm even naming this. It's named right in the file. Sweep G-string. Gotta sweep that G-string. That's what all the kids are talking about. Uh, we'll do base string two for our texture here. We will go to our, oh wait, I wanna actually make this out of a material first. Okay. And then go to our appearance here, mapping, and we'll go to surface. And let's make this 90. Of course, if I had all the stuff that I'm doing here with like the scale and the uh, um, changing the angle and everything, if I had just done that in the image file, then I wouldn't have to do it every time here in the, um, oh, it doesn't look good. I wouldn't have to do it here in the, you know, in the material appearance manager. Control Q, do a hide, do a hide, do a hide. Gotta rename this. Sweep D string. Sweeping the D string. Slapping the base, sweeping the D string. Right mouse button, plain carbon steel. Give it this appearance. Go here, do one of these, do one of these, do one of these. Yeah, that is cool that equations um, support move bodies. I could see that being pretty good. Repairing broken mate. I mean, you know what's funny is that I had a mate fail in um, uh, 2015 while we were doing this project. It happened, I, I think it actually happened earlier this week. And, oh, you know, I think it was last week. And I did like, so I did a replace component and uh, 
SolidWorks was like, hey, you know, you're replacing this component. You, you did it twice, uh, repaired your mates twice. Do you want me just to go through and repair all the other mates? And I remember the SolidWorks added that automatic uh, repair of mates, but I didn't realize they added it as early as 2015. Like when, the, when I saw that, I was like, oh, dang, this is awesome. So, yeah, I agree, um, you know, the replace, you know, replacing, repairing mates is very good, but a lot of that stuff was already in the software and it's just like they made a slight tweak and then added it to the what's new. This is it, guys. This is a perfect song to end on. That's another assembly, right? This is it. We're at the end. Nothing. Yeah, I remember I used to, I, I'm thinking about what you're saying about the notepad. I remember I used to go and get like 10 pages of notes of what's new. And now it's like two lines, like what you're saying. All right, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Guys, I told you we were only going to go for an hour today, and we ended up going for two. Let's go. Worth it. Totally worth it. Look at that thing. Man, that makes me happy. Wow. We're going to turn up the music a little now, because that makes me very happy. All right, let's check in active document. Let's make sure everything's going into the correct project. We did it. We got the strings on. What day is this? Is this day 16? I think we said we were going to have this thing done by day 17. I think we might actually do it. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Time flies when you're modeling. Yeah, I agree. I agree, Brad. Brad, what do you think about this paint on this uh, this guitar? I think it, I love the way it came out. I think it's so cool. Like It's one of those things where like you don't even see it unless you open up the, the body on its own. But then when you see that it's got like actual paint, paint texture and wood texture, it's like, how, how do you do that? That's so cool. I love the way that looks so much. It's kind of similar to how I did the grip tape on the uh, skateboard project, which we're going to be bringing that one back too. We're going to be bringing back the skateboard project. Wow, Victor K, super chat. I think that's the first super chat in 2023. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Representing. All right, guys, this is perfect. It's a perfect way to end, a perfect song to end on. Uh, we did it. We got the four strings in there. I am very, very happy. Make this an explode view. Let's do it. Let's see what happens. I like doing the explode view in uh, virtual reality because it's just one click and everything just goes everywhere. It's so funny in the uh, indie drawings. That's something that's newer than 2015, right? But it's in 2020. It's like. Everything that I want that's not in 2015 just about is in 2020. Um, the one exception is like a little minor thing with color selection that I think is really cool in 2021. But All right. Turning this song down just a little bit. We're going to the next song. Let's see what we can do to explode this thing. Uh, new exploded view. And we're going to say select subassembly parts. And we're gonna say auto space components. And we're gonna say everything. Here we go. Oh, I thought that was gonna be, <laughs> I thought that was gonna be a lot more dramatic. Select subassembly parts. Why didn't it, why didn't everything just go everywhere? That's what should have happened. Oh there we go. You know, went the wrong direction. Yeah. Yes. Let's go. That's pretty cool. I love having all the wiring and stuff in here. I just think that looks so epic. View sketches, turn off our sketches here, turn off our curves. Boom. Let's rip this thing in both directions. Got that extra, that extra weird step where things just move over for no reason. This is like a good, this is a good bass song too. This thing can, it's dancing to the bass song. We'll make a proper, 
we'll make a proper uh, explode view of this thing. But guys, I gotta say I'm happy. This makes me very happy. I'm very glad that we were able to get the strings in there today. I'm very happy with how the tuners look. I'm very happy with uh, with all of it. Um, really, the only thing left to do on this for tomorrow is uh, make the cover plate for the truss rod, maybe go through and do a little bit of cleanup. And um, I was gonna model the strap for this thing. I did model the strap on my uh, on the other base that I, that I drew up in SolidWorks. So I was gonna model the strap for this thing. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how we're how we're feeling uh, tomorrow. But then we gotta come up with a good way of giving this thing away. Um, I don't know how we're gonna do it. I don't know if we're gonna do it by uh, attendance or if we're just gonna have a, I'll probably just make a video that says I'm gonna give away the base and uh, I'll I'll have like a comment section. Like if you want a bit, cause I don't wanna send it to somebody random and have them be like, I'm never gonna play this. Like I don't want this thing in my house. So maybe I'll just make a comment section that says like, if you want the base, you know, add a comment below and Tell me your favorite song on bass or something. <laughs> Whatever, or like what, or what you would do with it or something. I don't know. You don't have to justify it. I just don't want to give it to somebody who doesn't want it. You know, if you're like, I'm not even gonna play it, but I think it would look cool in the background. You know, like whatever. Okay, fine. Let's do it. It doesn't matter to me. Dang, this thing looks good. Yeah. Looks awesome. Even with that like cheesy texture that's just this, diagonal lines, it still looks really good. I guess they really didn't even need to be diagonal. They could have just been straight. I could have angled the thing, but I wonder if that would have made for, eh, yeah, it probably wouldn't have made for better texturing. I know I'm just, I'm just like uh, stroking my own ego here, but uh, this is what's up, man. This thing looks awesome. So yeah, so I'll, I think the other thing I'd want to do is go through and do some final cleanup. Um, there's still some toolbox parts in here, and the reason we don't want toolbox parts is because when the part has a flag in it that says that it's a toolbox part, you run into um, maybe unexpected results. So like this here, flathead 100 screw. You know, we saw earlier in the presentation that I took that and I did a uh, save as, named it R RBG608, saved the assembly, closed the assembly, reopened the assembly, and it, it, it reverted to this toolbox part. Now, the reason that SolidWorks does that is legitimate. Like it, it, it's it's so that if you're working on a team with a team of people and you have your toolbox library over here and somebody on your team goes home and makes, uh, uh, makes some changes to the assembly at home using their toolbox library from home, well, the next day when that person brings that assembly back to the office and goes to open it, SolidWorks knows to reference the library, the, the centralized library that's got all the appropriate metadata in it. So like, it's a, it's a legitimate replace. It's, it's expected functionality. It's what SolidWorks should do, but uh, we don't want that. We wanna get rid of that altogether. We wanna divorce these files from toolbox using that divorce toolbox flag. So that's something that I'll, I'll probably clean up a little bit. I don't like when I rotate here, I can see the little cosmetic threads that are probably coming from these tap holes uh, that I put here. I probably put a tap hole in here or maybe, might even be coming from the screws, but I think I probably put a tap hole here in the body. I don't see them anymore. Maybe they were in that plate somehow. Um, but I want to get rid of that. I don't like having those uh, cosmetic threads because if I show this thing in black and white or if I show it in a different CAD system, uh, I'm not going to carry over that cosmetic thread functionality. So I'd rather just uh, graphically show that, even though I know I take a hit when I graphically show that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, overall, we're pretty much done, guys. We did it. This is cool. We're on the... The final steps, the final stages. It almost looks like it's supposed to be a pick guard, but it's not. It's just a surface that I made. And I like regret making it. I hate that it's in the, not hate, but I'm not happy that it's in the model. I, I don't like that I made that surface. I know why I did it, um, but I might go through and reestablish some of those references in the electrical routes to not use that surface. I don't like the way that came out. Delete key bodies at the end for cleanup. I can't. I can't delete that body because it's um, it's used in the other. Uh, you know, you do make a good point though, Victor. I wonder if I could just hide if I hide that body in its part file. I wonder if then it would stop me from inadvertently showing. Um, let's see. If I open this part and then I just hide that those surface bodies. See, I can't delete them because they're they're used in context of the assembly and other parts. So it's not like they're used in context here earlier in the tree. They're actually used in context in the assembly. But you know what? I could just do that. I could just hide them there. Oh, Victor, you're a genius. Thank you. Yeah, you, no, I mean, 
You gave me a great suggestion, though. You, you got me right on the track. Because now I'm not going to inadvertently show that. Look, see, now if I shift tab, I'm not going to inadvertently show that surface body. Boom! Another, another engineering challenge solved by the most amazing chat ever. Oh, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Another thing we can do here uh, for cleanup, this is always a good good way to uh, uh, clean up your... And this could be another video clip, too. Here's something that you guys might not have known about. Uh, if you ever are in a situation where you've got an assembly and you feel like this bar is so wide because of how long these names are, you can right mouse button up at the top of the tree, and from the top of the tree, you can go to tree display, and you can say, show display state names. And just by getting rid of those display state names, you can see how much smaller this gets, and that means you're going to be a lot less likely to get that scroll bar at the bottom. But if you wanted to go one step further, you could do a right mouse button here, go tree display, show component configuration names, and now look how much cleaner this tree looks. So much better just by cleaning up that feature tree. If you guys like that tip and trick, be sure to like and subscribe and buy a t-shirt. I don't know if I'm going to actually use that one uh, in a clip because... I realize halfway through I have this thing exclude from bomb and that's still gonna be there no matter what. And you can't see the scroll bar at the bottom so it might not make a good clip. All right guys, uh, I think it's starting to snow outside. I think I need to get out there and start getting that firewood going uh, before I run out. So thank you guys so much for joining me today. This was absolutely epic. We did everything I wanted to do. We got some, uh, maybe some final cleanup to do tomorrow but I think tomorrow's probably gonna be the last stream on this. Um, on this uh, this particular project. Does 2015 have envelope? Yeah, I'm pretty sure 2015 has envelope. Um, let's see. Go to that part. Yep, it's got envelope. So I could do that too. It's a great, great thought as well. Because envelope auto excludes from bomb. Does it still show the tag though? In the tr it still shows the tag. Yeah. Great suggestion, Brad. That's I like that, uh, but it still shows in the in the tray. I should have just not used that surface. That's that was the thing. I was getting a little too clever, little too clever. And what I did, what I was doing with that was I was showing that surface to help me with the routing, so it would just make it easier as I was rotating around. But I should have just picked the faces of the you know of the the body. It would have been fine. It would have been fine, but it's still fine either way. We got the hide hide surface now. We're good that resolved all right guys uh thank you so much uh tomorrow will probably be the last day on this project but i got some other projects lined up i'll try to do like maybe one of these every month or you know maybe i'll do like six a year uh i know we started in december and went into january so maybe i'll do another one next month um i have uh i have some cool stuff queued up here for these types of uh formats so thank you so much victor thank you so much for the super chat like i said i think you're the first super chat in 2023 so very much appreciated and uh guys secret announcement here i haven't told anybody this yet but i'm going to be interviewing allness the world champion of speed modeling on monday night so uh if you guys are around monday night for model monday live be sure to tune into that thank you all so much for being the best chat ever uh this has been a lot of fun i'm looking forward to uh seeing what we come up with next and any thoughts suggestions ideas leave them in the comments and uh i'll see you guys tomorrow final day bye guys